Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS, and I want to welcome you all. Uh, this event, the tweet for this is uh, hash sign Women Global Health GH, Women GH. Um, we're going to open uh, with a, uh, a video of President Banda from Malawi, um, and uh, I'll offer a few opening remarks, and then following that, uh, I will introduce Secretary Sebelius, uh, who will deliver the keynote address here, and then thereafter, uh, we will have a, another video and then move towards a panel discussion led by Janet Fleischman. We're really thrilled that uh, uh, on the eve here of International Women's Day uh, that we were able to bring together Secretary Sebelius, uh, Christy Turlington Burns, uh, Christy Micus from the U.S. government, the PEPFAR coordinator in Zambia, Kay Warren from Saddleback Church, Dr. Phil Nyberg, uh, who's worked with us over the last decade to talk about the different dimensions of the challenges here as we look forward on women's health issues. Uh, we've just released uh, a major report um, that I hope you will all have had a chance to grab the chapter. We reproduced um, many copies of Janet Fleischman's chapter on women's health uh, for you today. That broader volume is also available online and we've handed out uh, a small placard that gives you instructions on how to, um, uh, to access that. Uh, we started that effort back in the fall with the view that uh, in, the, in the first Obama term there had been an enormous number of, of new policy initiatives and thinking and, 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 and it had been a period of great ferment and an activity uh, by leaders like Niels Dallaire here. Uh, thank you Niels for joining us and for making, uh, uh, making it with us today and helping us make this event possible. We were uh, trying to digest across multiple sectors the policies and, and, and programs that had, and approaches that had been launched in the first term and what had been the, um, uh, the impacts and the lessons learned and what were likely to be the recommended courses of action uh, 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 with respect to these different areas, HIV AIDS, um, uh, malaria, uh, polio, women's health. We took a special look at multilateral institutions and international health diplomacy. Um, I hope you'll all enjoy that and make good use of that. Uh, we have uh, had uh, and placed an enormous priority over the last uh, several years on women's health, and it's Janet Fleischman's leadership here at CSIS that's been most fundamental to that effort. Uh, we um, uh, started a long time back in uh, over a year ago in working collaboratively with the U.S. Embassy um, in Zambia to dive into a number of issues. Uh, and uh, most recent, and, and we're very grateful to Mark Storella, Ambassador Storella and his team for all of the support. We'll be going back there again in another two weeks with a delegation to look at three core dimensions of women's health and uh, uh, along with a number of, of key congressional staff and some of our own personnel. Uh, this is very important to us um, and it's something that we feel great pride in in carrying forward, and I think it's, it's, it's really a sign of how vitally important all of these issues have become to us, that all of you are here today uh, to join us in this, uh, in this effort. Um, so we're going to have three short videos that we'll intersperse through the program that really are, these are the voices of African women and men, uh, African women and African women leaders talking about the, uh, the, the different dimensions uh, of this agenda. We're gonna start uh, with, um, uh, uh, with President Banda. I want to recognize the ambassador to Malawi, uh, His Excellency Ambassador uh, Stephen Matenje, Ambassador. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and all of your, uh, uh, all of your support. Um, I also want to rec rec recognize Zambian Embassy representatives Ben Kongwa and Patricia Latia. Ben, are you here? Ben, thank you so much. You've been very supportive of our efforts over a long period of time. So uh, with that, uh, why don't we move to, um, to, uh, to our first video. I need to first say, though, uh, Julia Nagel, who's with us here today. Julia, could you stand up, please? Julia Nagel was, uh, was with us uh, as our uh, uh, social media and video expert for uh, two and a half years and has uh, moved to uh, Voxiva to do some additional work, and is, but is retaining a strong link to us and has been really vitally important 
in pioneering the work that we've done in video over the last two years. And Julie, I just want to sing you out for the, the extraordinary effort and contribution that you've made to us. And the, what you're going to see here over the course of the next two hours in the three videos is very much um, uh, uh, the, the product of your incredible commitment to bringing this all forward, along with Janet and the many other people here that that we will uh, talk about. So why don't we tee up our first video? We'll go through that. It's about five minutes, and then I'll introduce the secretary, and we'll hear from our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. My mission in life is to assist women and youth gain social and political empowerment through business and education, because it is only when a woman is economically empowered that she begins to make critical decisions about her health, especially at household level. I have found in the many years I've worked with women that it is when a woman is economically empowered that she can negotiate at household level with her husband about the number of children that body of hers can have. So we are tackling the provision of family planning devices. Secondly, we find that most women that die die giving birth. And I think as a woman leader, that's not acceptable. It is not possible for me to sit back and watch 690 women die out of every 100,000 giving life. That's not acceptable. I've grown up in a society where when a woman is pregnant, the whole village is anxious. I don't think as a country we have any choice. And I'm grateful to the government of the United States of America because they are the ones who are helping us in the, uh, providing treatment to pregnant women so that they don't pass on the virus to the child. So we see now a whole generation of children being born age-free because the, the mother has received precautionary treatment while she was pregnant. What breaks my heart is the fact that when you, if we see women that are dying, the 690, most of them are between 15 and 19. So the reason is they are not going to secondary school. They are not going to secondary school because it's not free. So when she cannot afford the $50, she drops out. And then the community encourages her to get married. And because her body is not ready for, for, for childbirth, they are the ones that are dying. That's why I'm sending 2,300 girls to school. Because I just believe that uh, keeping a girl in school four more years is not about, just about her future, it's about her health. You know, when a woman gets into state house, they notice the little things that would otherwise be ignored by a man. Issues of family planning, issues of maternal mortality, issues of malnutrition, issues of the well-being of the household. Therefore, to protect the woman, to provide a good life for her, to provide health for her, to provide education for the girl child is, is a must. It is unfortunate that I get into office when this country, country's economy was completely destroyed through greed, mismanagement, and corruption. It is extremely important to stay the course because it is tempting sometimes when you have elections in 15 months' time, you are tempted to say, well, let's, let's fix the culture, or well, let's, let's, let's backtrack for the purposes of the elections. But I have told myself that I have never let down my people. And while I'm trying to bring the country back on track, I'm also very mindful of my mission to make sure that I continue to empower women, I continue to ensure that they have access to family planning devices, they have uh, access to economic empowerment opportunities. Because for me, it is when you see a woman move from where she didn't know her next meal to a point where she begins to even get respect and begin to make decisions at household level because of the economic contribution she's making, for me, that is power. So for me, that's what being a leader is all about. Thank you very much. Um, uh, our next speaker is uh, our first, our keynote speaker is uh, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, who's been uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, uh, since April of 2009. 
Uh, we're uh, very, very fortunate that uh, she has chosen to stay on in that position in this critical second term uh, when the Affordable Care Act becomes reality in so many new and, and vitally important and profound ways. Um, she, prior to becoming secretary, served as governor of Kansas, 2003 to 2009, uh, served as the insurance commissioner prior to that. Uh, in her tenure during the first term, uh, the uh, HHS, the department, issued its first ever strategy on global health, uh, which was a very important effort at tying together the many different strings of effort and expertise and engagement uh, that the department encompasses into a much more coherent single strategy. In that period, uh, Nils Dallaire's Office of Global Affairs was elevated to Assistant Secretary rank, a very important and long overdue change. And congratulations, Nils. And uh, I might say also in our, uh, in, the, in the volume that we've shared with you, when you look at the sec section on multilaterals and you look at the work on WHO and some of the other, uh, some of the other multilateral institutions, one theme that jumps out is the degree to which under Nils' leadership the tone, the tenor, and the quality of our dialogue in Geneva and many other key places has improved dramatically, and it's borne us very significant concrete, concrete gains in terms of negotiated, uh, negotiated progress on some very important matters in global health. So I think we're making uh, great progress. And Secretary, thank you so much for for being here with us today. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and I am delighted to have a chance to be here today. Thank you, Steve, for that kind introduction, for your leadership of the center, and for uh, convening this really important discussion. Um, I want to join you in uh, acknowledging how much Dr. Nils Dolaire has uh, not only um, expanded and improved the global reach of the United States in health work uh, around the world, but also um, is active in a whole variety of strategic initiatives um, on behalf of Health and Human Services. And I'm really pleased to be here today to uh, speak about a top priority for the Obama administration, and certainly to me personally, one that I've worked on for a very long time, and that's the health of women and girls not only in this country, but around the world. Um, I was able to visit programs in East Africa in 2011. And one of the things that struck me, uh, and President Banda just referred to that, but is the strength and resilience of women that I met there. And I, I want to just tell you about one amazing woman which still kind of sticks out in my mind. In rural Kenya, I met a woman who was HIV positive named Jemima. And at one point, um, the effects of her illness were so bad that she had wasted down to about 77 pounds. And when she was in that um, near death state, a volunteer brought Jemima and her family to a health clinic that was supported by US government investments. Now, she went home with what's known as a basic care package, uh, which was a bundle of low-cost health interventions that had been developed by researchers from CDC's Global AIDS Program. And it was designed to prevent some of the most debilitating infections among people living with HIV. And before long, that basic health package was really having an impact. Jemima bounced back. She regained her healthy weight and she recovered strength to live and work again. But she didn't stop by just getting back her own health. She became a health leader in her community. She founded a group that offers emotional and financial support to those families affected by HIV. She sells health products to help support eight sick and orphaned children that she has adopted. And she's referred now more than 100 HIV-infected men, women, and children to the same facility where she got help. So investing in Jemima had an incredible ripple effect. We didn't just save her life or her family's life. We gave the community an amazing leader, an entrepreneur, and a lifetime advocate for health. 
So when the president made women's health a major focus in his global health initiative, it wasn't just about closing the huge gender disparities in access to care and treatment, and that is very significant and very important, closing those gaps. But it's about recognizing the truth that Jemima's story exemplifies. When we invest in the health of women and girls, it doesn't just improve the health outcomes for those individuals. It produces benefits that ripple through families, through communities, through nations. And it creates enormous returns in economic growth, in poverty reduction, and in overall development. No investment in this country, I would say, or around the world has a bigger payoff than investing in women's health. And thanks to the president's leadership and the amazing leadership of uh, former State Secretary Hillary Clinton and lots of other dedicated officials throughout the administration, we have made some incredible progress over the last four years. Now take HIV, for example, which for many years was considered primarily to be a men's health issue. Today we know an unfortunate truth. Women and girls make up more than half of the world's HIV-infected population, more than half. And HIV is now the leading cause of death for women of reproductive age worldwide. So that knowledge has bolstered initiatives like PEPFAR and put a new focus on reaching women whose lives are touched by the global HIV crisis. In the first half of this fiscal year, we've already reached more than 370,000 women with treatment, putting us on track to reach PEPFAR's target of an additional 1.5 million women in treatment by 2014. And we've also elevated global health to the forefront of our foreign policy through the development of new initiatives like USAID's gender equality and female empowerment policy, through new appointments, including the first ever ambassador for global women's issues, Milan Verveer. And we've created impressive new partnerships that have led to historic levels of global investment in family planning services, cervical and breast cancer screenings, and the prevention of sexual violence. And I know on the panel that follows me today, you're gonna hear from a number of people who are either doing on the ground incredibly important work or are part of that really strategic partnership across the globe. Now those accomplishments clearly are not the administration's accomplishments alone. The support of many domestic and international partners, including, as I said, lots of folks represented here today in this room, and the engagement of foreign governments has been essential to making progress. And we intend to continue to build on those partnerships in the years ahead, because for all the great work that has been done, there is way more to do. Now one area we know we need to do more is HIV prevention for mothers and children. And again, you just heard President Banda talk about it. We are making progress on ending mother to child HIV transmission by providing antiretroviral treatment to infected mothers. And we just had, I'm sure all of you saw, a breakthrough moment recently where the scientists at NIH um, were really heartened by the recent news that the aggressive antiretroviral treatment in a Mississippi young newborn may have completely removed the virus from her body. That's an amazing step forward. And while we're not yet ready to declare this as a path to curing AIDS, it, it was a breakthrough that will be followed very closely. We're also continuing to work to reduce the social barriers that prevent women from getting the care they need. As more women receive treatment and return to health, the stigma surrounding HIV is melting away, community by community, family by family, increasing the willingness of more women to be tested. But we have a long way to go. I was in a clinic in India and listened to the workers talk about the issue that if a woman gets treated uh, and is HIV positive, often she is then drummed out of the family unit 
made to leave her home, uh, even if the husband was the originator of the infection, he is protected and cherished and she is seen as um, someone who has brought the disease and shame on the family. So there is still a huge issue about testing and treatment that we need to deal with. But what we know is that if we can break down those barriers, it creates a positive cycle of awareness and treatment. And one, again, that strengthens local economies, protects children from becoming orphans, and brings us closer to achieving what I think is a universal goal of an AIDS-free generation that really is on the horizon. Now, a second cornerstone of the work we're doing will be reducing maternal mortality around the world. Every day, each and every day, about 800 women die during childbirth. More than one woman every two minutes. And when a mother dies, what we know is her child is seven times more likely to die within the first 12 months, even if they survive the birth. Those risks are even greater in the developing world, where three out of every four women in need of care for complications from pregnancy don't receive it. Three out of four. And even in the places where care is available, the demand is so great that it stretches resources to their limits. I was in a maternity ward in Zanzibar in 2011. There were so few beds in this maternity ward that women were sharing beds in a postnatal room, having just given birth to babies. There was very little blood supply. So relatives were in the courtyard waiting to see if there was a pregnancy complication so they could indeed be called upon to give blood. And those were just the women who made it to the birthing center. The hospital was doing heroic work in face of nearly impossible conditions. But even so, a heartbreaking number of women weren't getting the care they needed. Through new international public-private partnerships like Saving Mothers, Giving Life, we're working to change that. By providing mothers with essential care and resources that they need during labor, delivery, and the first 24 hours after birth, we're aiming to reduce maternal mortality rates by 50% in targeted countries. In Zambia and Uganda, that work is already underway. A third area of ongoing focus is the work to reduce gender-based violence. Now here in the US, we have a major milestone going on right now as I speak to you, with the President signing the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. And I was actually with the President at a meeting this morning, and he said, I'll see you later at the signing. I said, no, I'm standing you up because I'm talking to a really important group about worldwide reach on women's health. But we know that around the world, many women face even greater risk for domestic and interpersonal violence. And that's why in the second term, we'll be implementing the first ever US strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally. And it provides concrete action to support vulnerable women and girls through the State Department and USAID. Now, we all can be proud of the progress that's been made over the past four years. Thanks to hard work and efforts of dedicated partners at home and abroad, we've been able to put some important policies in place. We've gotten some effective programs off the ground. But now is the time that we must ensure that the groundwork is turned into real results for women and girls everywhere. As we move forward, it's been particularly heartening to me to see a wave of women moving into global health leadership around the world. Here in the Americas with our neighbors, 14 of our hemisphere's health ministers, including my good partners in Canada and Mexico, are women, as is our newly elected Pan American Health Organization Regional Director, Dr. Carissa Etienne. In Africa, eight health ministers are women, as is the new chair of the African Union, Dr. Delami Zuma, who I met with just last week. And of course, the World Health Organization is led by Margaret Chan, again a woman. I've had the opportunity to know these remarkable women. But as President Banda said so well, 
women bring their life experience to the table. Having these expanded number of women serving as presidents of countries, as health leaders, as ministers, as leaders in the World Health Organization means that the issues around the health of women and girls are not going to disappear from the agenda anytime soon. These women bring with them their own deep commitment to the health and well-being of girls and women. As we continue the fight for women's health across the globe, we can't forget that ensuring equality in health has to again start here at home. Now from his first days in office, and as Steve said through the passage of the Affordable Care Act, the president has made women's health a centerpiece of his domestic agenda. Because of the law, insurers will, in the very near future, be forbidden from charging women higher premiums just because of their gender. Being a woman, as I like to say, will no longer be a pre-existing condition in America. That practice will be gone for good. And we're also ending, finally, what has been a ridiculous double standard in way too many plans, where Viagra is treated like an essential medication and birth control like a luxury product. Because of the new law, tens of mi millions of women can now walk into their doctor's office and get contraceptive care and other critical preventive services without co-pays or co-insurance, taking down a huge financial barrier. And when the new health marketplace is open for enrollment in October, every plan will be required to cover prenatal and maternity care. A welcome change from today's market, where that kind of comprehensive coverage is the exception and not the rule for far too many insurance policies that women deal with. So women of all ages are actually great beneficiaries of the Affordable Care Act. Young women under 26 are eligible for coverage on, on their parents' plans. Working women who are less likely to receive insurance through their employers are gaining greater access to affordable options. Older women who make up the majority of Medicare enrollees are seeing the quality of their care go up and costs go down. So we are going to spend the next term building on that progress here and abroad. And although some of the faces in the administration may change, this guiding principle never will. That no woman anywhere should be denied the care and support she needs to live a healthy life and take care of herself and her children. That's a message you're going to keep hearing from this administration during the second term. With your help, with those of you in this room and the organizations, entities you represent, we have the opportunity over the next four years to touch millions more lives and improve the welfare of countless communities. It's our responsibility to use the time we have to see that mission through. And I look forward to working with all of you toward that shared goal. Thank you very much. Again, thank you all for coming. Before we turn to the next panel, we'd like to show you our latest video, which is focusing exactly on some of the issues that Secretary Sebelius was referring to, maternal mortality, and a new initiative to address it called Saving Mothers Giving Life. This is the premiere of this video. You may have seen the others, uh, but this one is just first being shown today. Uh, we looked at mor maternal mortality because every day, nearly 800 women die from complications of pregnancy and childbirth around the world, and 99% of these occur in developing countries. These deaths are largely preventable with interventions and training to prevent or treat complications such as hemorrhage, infection, obstructed labor, and with increased access to reproductive health and emergency care. This video explores the challenges and opportunities to address these issues in Zambia, a country with disproportionately high maternal mortality. The Saving Mothers Giving Life Initiative, a public-private partnership strongly supported by the U.S. government, aims to reduce maternal mortality by up to 50% in selected districts of Zambia and Uganda. 
The voices of these women in Zambia remind us that effectively addressing maternal mortality in Zambia and elsewhere will demand ongoing commitments and investments from national governments, international partners, and community-based groups. So once again, let me thank the Zambian government for allowing us to film at these sites to make the, video you'll, the videos you'll see today. Uh, the Zambian healthcare workers and women who helped us understand the realities of maternal mortality in their country. The Hewlett Foundation for their generous support that allowed us to make these videos. The extraordinary CSIS video team that traveled with me to Zambia and Malawi, Chris Latendra for his wonderful camera work, and Julia Nagel for her masterful ability to translate these complicated realities into such a visually compelling product. And finally, to Steve Morrison, whose support for the work on women's health and, glo and uh, women's global health, and whose leadership and vision has made this work possible. So if we cue the lights. <laughs> In Zambia, when women have delivered, we say, oh, you have survived. We continue to have a very high mortality in Zambia. Our women die before labor, during labor, and after labor. And one of the challenges has been that less than 50% of women can access skilled delivery. A lot of women are not accessing the healthcare services on time because we have a lot of uh, women living in far away places, away from the hospital. So by the time they reach here, it, it would have been too late for them. Yes, at the facility level, so there are delays. In the past, when the woman got to the facility, one, there will be issues to do with equipment may not be readily available. Even the actual drugs needed for them to attend to the, to the lady may not be readily available at that point. So they would come to the clinic, they would come to the facility, but then they would not be able to get the service that they need most. Where do women die? They die soon after delivery. So you see why skilled deliveries is of uttermost importance. What we are doing in the Saving Mothers Giving Lives really hinges on reducing those delays. And so we have a system at the community level, we have introduced a structure of the uh, Safe Motherhood Action Groups. These are mothers and the fathers that are serving the community. And we train them, we provide a basic training so that mothers are easily identified early enough and encouraged to go to health facility to seek uh, services for the well-being of the mother and the well-being of the child. The U.S. government put funds for us to be used in four districts so that we can, in those four districts, reduce mortality by 50% by using well-known interventions, treating women, helping women deliver in facilities, doing quality antenatal care, and the whole package. So we have embarked on retraining the staff, providing them with basic skills, for instance, uh, the emergency obstetrical and neonatal care. We've also been able to provide a training uh, for the Helping Babies Breathe, which is focused on resuscitation of the, the newborn. The training has helped me uh, in so many ways, in that supposing a woman comes in labor, I know what to do. And if there's any complication, I know how to go about it in order to help this woman and probably save her life as well as the babies. Our 
almost all these initiatives are related to the saving mothers giving lives. Russian partners are very important because as a country we will not be able to meet all these obligations without international support. The partnership with the US government is important to Zambia because we started a long journey and we can't do it alone. It's very, very costly and we need the support from the US government so that every woman can look forward to labor and not say, I may die. I'm hoping that uh, these programs should not come to an end and that they should continue. When a mother dies in a community, it's really sad. It's a sad situation. If a woman dies, the nation dies with that uh, woman because the nation starts from the family and we know that the woman in Zambia is the one who provides in a lot of respects. Ba bakazi banzanga ninga bawoza kuti bazibwera kuno ko hospital to azipapira ko hospital chifukwa cha kuti ukabwera ko hospital ama kutandiza. Bonzo mine bifunikira ama kutandiza buno buno pamana kupapira ku nyumba. What of hate from the women is that uh, when they deliver they go back home confident that they have a healthy baby and their lives were handled by um, professionals. They know that even when they get pregnant next time they'll be given the best of care. Sorry, I'm going to invite the panel to come up now. Uh, and while they are coming up to the stage, all of you please, um, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of important uh, partners. First of all, the Gates Foundation, which has been hugely supportive of our work here at the Global Health Policy Center. And I believe Julie Bernstein and Tom Walsh are here, so we're glad you could, you could come today. And we want to acknowledge the Global Health and Development course from GW. Um, Vic Barbiero's class, they're back here. We're glad you could come. Um, and I will introduce everyone uh, first, and then we will, we will all we'll go down the line. Uh, given the shortness of time and the uh, desire to open this up for questions, we're really going to keep this to five-minute short presentations. Uh, and as moderator, I will use my prerogative to make sure they understand that. Um, but we are delighted that such an incredible panel has been able to gather here today. I will start, we're going to start with Christy Turlington Burns, who is the founder of Every Mother Counts, a campaign to end preventable deaths caused by pregnancy and childbirth around the world. Every Mother informs, engages, and mobilizes new audiences to take action to improve the health and well-being of girls and women worldwide. In 2010, Christy directed and produced No Woman, No Cry, a documentary film about the global state of maternal health. She is an advisor to the Harvard Medical School Global Health Council and the Harvard School of Public Health Board of Deans Advisors, Every Mother Every Day, and the White Ribbon Alliance. Christy. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to participate in such a wonderful panel. Um, so I became a maternal health advocate when I became a mom. Um, I actually experienced and survived one of the complications that is the leading cause of maternal mortality around the world. And that experience and the knowledge of the deaths that were taking place at the time of that, of my first delivery, were what got me to engage um, on this issue. And at that time, in 2003, uh, the global maternal mortality statistics were at half a million plus women dying each year. Um, that number has come down significantly. but it was the, the fact that 90% of those deaths were preventable that uh, got me excited and, and want to engage. Um, I then traveled with uh, the NGO CARE to a number of countries and one of the, the experiences that I had that really got me excited and uh, moved me to make No Woman No Cry was a program in, in uh, Peru which reduced maternal mortality in half in five years. And seeing how they were able to do that, um, it, it was something that I thought was so doable when I left seeing this FEMI project in, in Ayacucho. And I came home, I decided to make the film, I traveled around the world for two years, traveling to four continents to look at those barriers that women face each and every day when trying to access maternity care at the critical moments. Um, and so it was really with that experience and, and what I saw and learned on that 
trip, to, or those many trips to make the film that uh, got me to want to start Every Mother Counts. I thought if I could inspire other people like myself who were connected to this issue based on the experience of becoming mothers themselves or watching loved ones go through the experience and get the care that they needed at that time, um, that we could do something about this, that we could actually really make a significant impact on these global numbers. Um, so that's why I got excited when we were invited to the table when Saving Mothers Giving Life was, was being formed. And um, three of our colleagues are here, Anjali and Claudia and Selena. Um, to sit down and hear about these ambitious goals, I thought, wow, if we can do this, this will inspire so many more people, like myself, everyday American citizens, who once they learn the facts, they want to get involved and they want to engage and they want to be a part of, of creating um, possibility and outcomes. And then the idea that it made such good sense to build on existing infrastructure and platforms through PEPFAR in the two countries where, where we're focused, um, that just really inspired me, got me excited and want me to, wanted me to, or inspired me to really want to engage and share what I was learning through seeing these positive outcomes and these success stories, to share that with the American public to get to get more involvement. So um, I welcome uh, sitting here at this panel and having a deeper discussion. But thank you so much. Our next speaker is Christy Mikus from the PEPFAR coordinator from Zambia, who just arrived at yesterday. Uh, she has been the PEPFAR coordinator in Zambia since 2008. Before her current position, she was a special assistant and Southern Africa team leader in the office of the Director of Foreign Assistance at the State Department. And before that, uh, she was with OGAC, where she began working with PEPFAR when the office was first created in 2004. Christy. Thanks, Janet. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to today's discussion, and a huge thanks to CSIS for putting on um, not only today's discussion, but also these remarkable videos. Um, and I was with, I had the, the pleasure of being with Janet and her team members when they came to Zambia to film the videos, and I can attest to the fact that they really um, are concerned with uh, not only the, the health of these women, but that we have approaches that are sustainable. They're not afraid to ask the hard questions. And so, Janet, I just want to thank you um, so much for, for hosting all of us today. Um, so today, I wanted to talk to everyone about how we are able to leverage the PEPFAR platform for broader gains in women's health, and in Zambia in particular. Um, PEPFAR, as you know, is the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Um, and in, in Zambia, uh, we're working in a country that is, um, it's a landlocked country with eight international borders um, and a population of about 13.7 million people. The HIV prevalence rate in Zambia is about 12.5%. Um, and as many of you know, AIDS disproportionately affects women, and about 16% of women in Zambia are infected with the virus. Um, and also we know that um, the rates in the urban areas are much higher. They're closer to 20% um, of people infected with HIV and about 10% in the rural areas. So it's certainly been a big problem um, in Zambia. So the, the PEPFAR program in Zambia is a $306 million a year program um, of bilateral support. So it's, there's been about $1.9 billion provided to Zambia um, since its inception. And there's an, an additional billion dollars of global fund money for Zambia. So there's a tremendous amount of funding um, for, to fight HIV AIDS in Zambia. And there's a strong track record of success. Zambia is one of the um, secretary uh, former Secretary Clinton's um, blueprint, country, blueprint countries um, for, how, for the different mix of interventions that could really be a turning point for achieving an AIDS-free generation. So Zambia is one of those countries where we have the potential to really get it right um, and really see an AIDS-free generation. Um, Zambia also benefits from many central initiatives. Um, there are a lot of central initiatives out of Washington, out of OGAC, and many of the different USG agencies that Zambia is very fortunate to benefit from, as well as public-private partnerships. And we're I'm going to talk briefly about two of them today. 
So in PEPFAR, the HIV AIDS prevention, care and treatment, and health system strengthening programs are implemented by five U.S. government agencies and 100 partners. Um, just very briefly, the scale-up of treatment in Zambia, I think, is the reason why we can now have some of these discussions here today about maternal mortality um, and even uh, women's cancers in Zambia. Because in 2004, before PEPFAR began, fewer than 3,500 people were accessing life-saving ARVs. There were funerals every weekend. I mean, it really just, everything kind of came to a halt. Um, and now we see that nearly half of a million of Zambians are accessing life-saving treatment, um, which has just made a huge difference. Um, this is one component of PEPFAR, but we also uh, have seen tremendous gains in preventing mother-child transmission, for example, where we had, again, fewer than uh, two or 3,000 accessing prevention of mother-child transmission services in 2004, and now over 600,000 women benefiting from those services. So we couldn't be happier with the results um, of, of our PMTCT and our HIV efforts. And about 85% of mothers are linked to treatment um, in some form or fashion. So we really see a lot of the women who um, are, sh are showing up to access those services. So we're able to build on some of these investments that we've made in PEPFAR in a couple of different partnerships. Um, one of them is Saving Mothers Giving Life, which we're hearing about today, uh, but also Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, which you may not know much about, but I'll talk about that just for a moment. And then there are additional opportunities in family planning and HIV program integration. Um, you know, PEPFAR has saved millions of lives, as we just heard Secretary Sibelius mention. Um, but they did this, but PEPFAR was able to do this by providing training, by building lab systems and capacity, by providing monitoring and evaluation to ensure good quality. It's not just about the numbers, but also about quality. And investing in programs to ensure a safe blood supply, to ensure an adequate supply of medicines, the supply chain itself. Um, and in some cases, providing infrastructure. So with these investments, that's what we're calling the PEPFAR platform. Um, it gives us a chance now to make sure that we are addressing other concerns that, um, that affect women in the global health context. So briefly, I'll talk about Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. Um, this is the initiative that has been started by four different uh, organizations, George W. Bush Institute, UNAIDS, Susan G. Komen for the Cure, and the United States government are the four founding partners. And the reality is that cervical cancer is the leading cause of cancer mortality in Africa, and Zambia has the second highest cervical cancer incidence globally. This became a big issue for us in Zambia, working with the government of Zambia, because women who are HIV infected are four to six times more likely to have cervical cancer than women who are uninfected. So we were seeing this as, this is a problem for women who are HIV infected. And unlike in the States or in other parts of the world where you see women who have cervical cancer in their 40s, 50s, 60s, in, in Zambia we see women in their 20s with cervical cancer. I mean, it was really something that we couldn't ignore. So the pink ribbon, red ribbon, there are four or five different, uh, depending, depending on how we classify them, interventions. First, we have primary, primary prevention of cervical cancer, which is the HPV vaccine. We also have secondary prevention, primarily through screening and treatment. And then uh, we all, the palliative care portion, we would consider that part of pink ribbon, red ribbon. PEPFAR Zambia through, uh, through Washington is providing direct financial support to, to provide services to these women for the secondary prevention component. We're increasing our um, test and treat services. But everything that we have invested in in PEPFAR, so if, if I had a slide, you'd be able to see a little bit easier. But uh, in terms of awareness, advocacy, and mobilization, the policy environment, um, infrastructure, human resources for health, lab systems, equipment, supply chains, safe blood, I mean, all of, these, all of these different areas that we've already invested in sort of weave throughout the different, invention, di different interventions for cervical cancer and make a, a scale up of a cervical cancer program like this not that difficult. I mean, it's, everything is difficult, but um, it, it's funding either on the margins or sometimes no funding at all needed. It's really just tweaking what we've already invested in. So it's really an incredible opportunity. Um, I won't say too much about saving mothers giving life because we'll have plenty of opportunities to talk about that. Um, but I just want to say that uh, about one in 37 women in Zambia um, in particular will die of, uh, while giving birth. And we know that the majority of these deaths are preventable. And so we already know that 85% of women are accessing mother-to-child transmission. 94% are accessing 
um, antenatal care at least one point in their life. And so we're, we're getting the women in. They want the services. We just have to make sure that we make the most of that. So again, saving mothers, giving life is building from um, strength and supply chain, um, different advances that we have at the facilities, transportation of pregnant women, blood supply. Everything we're investing in for, uh, for PEPFAR are things that benefit women and children um, in Zambia. Going quickly, I've been given the warning that I have less than a minute now. Um, so with, if I can just say just 30 seconds about family planning and HIV programming integration, um, Zambia has one of the highest fertility rates in the world, an average of 6.3 children per women live births. Um, and so we also see that 98% of, of people know about contraception, but 80% of, of women are not asking about family planning at a facility level or with health care workers in the field. We know they're coming in to prevent mother-child transmission. We know they're coming in to access antenatal care. It's a missed opportunity if we then don't do a little extra to talk to them about family planning services if they want them. And so I think really the, the takeaway message is that we've done so much in HIV AIDS with PEPFAR, and we're doing a lot more now with Saving Mothers and with Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon for Cervical Cancer with just a little bit extra on the margins, and some of it doesn't even require funding, um, I think we can have even a greater impact on women's health in Zambia and around the world. So with that, thank you so much for your attention. Sorry, thanks very much. We're going to now turn to Kay Warren, the co-founder of the Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, with her husband, Rick and the founder of the HIV and AIDS Initiative at Saddleback. She's a Bible teacher, author, and international speaker. Kay frequently travels the globe to encourage men, women, and children living with HIV and AIDS, as well as vulnerable children, and today she's a powerful voice on their behalf. Her latest book, Choose Joy Because Happiness Isn't Enough, was published in 2012. Kay? push the button moment first. It's a pleasure to be with you to join this vital conversation about women and girls. Saddleback's peace plan has been active in Rwanda since 2005, and in partnership with the churches of Rwanda, and in many instances the government of Rwanda, we've collaborated around HIV and AIDS, orphan care, poverty reduction, illiteracy, clean water, land grabbing, training community health care workers, leadership development, and church health. And more recently, we've expanded our efforts to include three more issues that directly affect women's health and well-being. The first is around HPV. More than 135,000 12 to 15-year-old girls have been vaccinated against HPV in Rwanda in the last two years through the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon Initiative. And in the churches we partner with, we encourage the pastors to promote the HPV vaccination. Because the vaccine is new to Rwanda, we have witnessed the ongoing suspicion of Western vaccinations, as well as fear related to a sexually transmitted disease, fear of a vaccine related to a sexually transmitted disease. But the pastors who are at the community level, they can be legitimizers, a trusted source of information in every congregation who can dispel myths and stigma. Many of these rural congregations are very conservative, but the pastors can say things like, there are medical things that we must do to protect our daughters against diseases that may come from others, and there is nothing that contradicts scripture. That may seem alien in our culture, but in a conservative rural community, those are the messages that pastors can give. And so pastors become allies, powerful allies, for better health for the women and the girls in their congregation. Then economic empowerment. Six, since 2008, more than 300 savings groups have been established through local churches. Each particular savings group sets its own rules and standards for participation. Most require a seed donation of about 5,000 Rwandan francs, which is the equivalent of three US dollars, but it varies with the group. And then the group decides how they want to use these shared savings. Some groups decide that this month, one woman will receive all of the money, and then the next month, another woman will receive all of the savings. Some decide to pool the savings and start a business or an enterprise together. 
It is, it is an incredible wealth creation vehicle for very rural women who live in extreme poverty. Since 2008, this group, these groups have saved one million US dollars. Gender-based violence is an area in which we have begun to speak with the churches. Through a program called the Clinical Church, the Rwandan pastors have been exposed to training on gender-based violence. Just last week, a presentation was made by the CB CDC to my colleague and 20 lay social workers that she was training. The, sh the statistics were shocking and sobering, and perhaps some of you already know the horrible statistic that I'm about to share, but according to a World Health Organization report, among women aged 15 to 44, gender violence accounts for more death and disability than cancer, malaria, traffic injuries, and war put together. The news about gender-based violence is devastating and it rips at all of our hearts. But just as the faith community can be helpful in passing on correct messages about vaccinations, provide pathways for wealth creation for the poorest of the poor, the faith community can also play a significant role in eliminating gender-based violence. Each of the seven strategies identified by WHO's violence prevention, the evidence, falls within the scope of the church's purview in one way or the other. The seven preventions are, seven evidences are developing safe and stable and nurturing relationships between children and their parents and caregivers. That's a role the church can play as they teach families what it means, how to parent, providing preschools for children. The second is to develop life skills in children and adolescents. Again, the church has a role to play in providing training for children and adolescents. The third is reducing availability and harmful use of alcohol. Well, the church commonly has a message about alcohol control, but there's also programs of recovery where um, those who are struggling with alcohol addiction are able to find um, relief from the addiction and to find a new way of living. Reducing access to guns and knives, promoting gender equality to prevent violence against women, changing cultural and social norms that support violence, and victim identification care and support programs. All of these fall within the sweet spot of the church. These are messages that churches can give to their congregations of the roles of equality between men and women, of honoring and valuing children and boys and girls. Last week in Rwanda, pastors gathered to share what they were doing to eliminate gender-based violence. One pastor said that he used to preach that women needed to endure beatings when her husband, if a woman's husband was drunk, he used to tell them that they should endure that because that was her role as a wife. But with one training on gender-based violence last year, he changed his mind entirely, met with his denominational leaders, and now has a program in his church that includes volunteers who go as a group to confront men who are threatening to harm women and children. They now report abuse to the authorities, bring violence out into the open in the community, and have created a safe place for women to go in the community to find safety in an emergency. Imagine what could happen countrywide with more than just one training. One training made such an amazing difference in one pastor. Imagine the cultural mores that could be changed with more training. We are grateful for the strong communities of faith in Rwanda that promote better health for women and girls. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Our last speaker for this part of the panel is going to be Dr. Phil Nyberg, a board certified pediatrician with additional training in infectious disease, preventive medicine and public health, and with service as a US military physician. Uh, Phil served as a medical epidemiologist in various programs for the CDC. Uh, and since 2003, he has been a senior associate here with the Global Health Policy Center. Phil. Thank you, Janet. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Janet asked me to, to talk about uh, the impact of family planning or, or the lack of it on, on maternal mortality and other key women's health indicators. So I'd, I'd like to start by reflecting for a minute on, on uh, the Millennium Development Goal number five, um, which is not just about preventing maternal deaths. <clears throat> Millennium Development Goal number five is actually uh, titled to improve uh, maternal health. And there are two targets for the goal. One is to reduce maternal mortality, which we hear a lot about. 
And the second target is to achieve universal access to reproductive health, which we don't hear a lot about. Um, of the six indicators for that, that uh, MDG, um, the three that are almost never mentioned um, are uh, the contraceptive prevalence rate in countries, the unmet need for family planning, and the adolescent birth rate. So each of these uh, indicators are, are directly related to women's access to family planning uh, information and services. The second point, uh, second reflection point is about uh, intimate partner violence or gender-based violence. Um, and you just heard Kay Warren give some of the statistics on this. Uh, Pregnancy-related deaths related to violence, um, such as homicide, are not included in maternal mortality estimates. Uh, in fact, they're specifically ex excluded by the, def the current definition, uh, which talks about any death of a woman while pregnant related to pregnancy, uh, but at the end it says specifically not from accidental or incidental causes. And so currently, um, deaths due to homicide or suicide that are pregnancy related are, are not counted. Um, and the third point is maternal morbidity which is uh, non-fatal uh, outcomes. Uh, many women who survive pregnancy complications are left with severe permanent uh, physical or emotional uh, or social disabilities, such as infertility, prolapsed uterus, uh, obstetric fistula, and injuries from uh, pregnancy-related violence. Uh, and those uh, morbidity, severe, serious morbidity, is 15 to 30 times as common as uh, mortality. Um, and there's an excellent review of this, uh, this topic by uh, Karen Hardy, Jill Gay, and Anne Blank in, in the uh, journal Global Public Health from last, last summer, for any of you who, are, who want to read about it. Specifically in terms of maternal mortality, uh, the direct causes we heard a little bit about, but there are eclampsia, uh, prolonged or obstructed labor, postpartum hemorrhage, infection, and unsafe abortion. Um, those are the direct causes uh, that is result directly from complications of pregnancy. The indirect cause, those, res those account for about 80% um, of, of all maternal deaths. There are a number of indirect causes related to diseases like malaria or HIV. Um, but, but remember, these causes of deaths are, are uh, decided using the medical model. And, and uh, Secretary Sebelius talked about uh, her, what she said, I think, was the social barriers that prevent she talked about the social barriers that prevent women from getting the care that they need. And there are a number of social issues underlying social and economic causes of uh, uh, maternal mortality that, that are, are not being directly addressed at the moment, uh, or not being s sufficiently addressed at the moment. Um, so it's worth keeping in mind that uh, uh, family planning can reduce the numbers of maternal deaths in at least four ways. First. Um, Remember, there are about 15% of women who develop, uh, who are pregnant, develop unanticipated complications, and reducing the number of pregnancies will reduce those unexpected complications resulting in death, and therefore the number of women with severe uh, complications as well, uh, but severe but non-fatal complications. Second, delaying first pregnancies until after adolescence. <coughs> sorry. Uh, means that fewer women will have prolonged or obstructed labors because of their immature pelvic structures. Third, because most unsafe abortions occur in unplanned pregnancies, uh, having fewer unplanned pregnancies will mean uh, fewer unsafe abortions, fewer abortions overall, and so therefore fewer maternal deaths. And the fourth, um, <coughs> family planning, um, the fourth relates to the fact that women uh, uh, with five or more pregnancies are um, at a greater risk of death during pregnancy than women with fewer. And so having fewer unplanned pregnancies in those multiparous, uh, that is, high, repeatedly pregnant women means that fewer pregnancies among those uh, uh, women will result in death. Uh, there was a great paper in The Lancet last summer that talked about, that used data from 167 countries and and indicated that the global un, that satisfying the global unmet need for family planning would result in uh, a, a rapid 29 percent reduction in, in global and maternal mortality. And I, I should also point out finally that that um, access to family planning also has child survival benefits. So if fewer uh, mothers die, fewer motherless children uh, um, will die. Those and those children have high mortality rates. 
and fewer unplanned pregnancies means better birth spacing and, and therefore uh, um, children who are, who are spaced appropriately have uh, lower uh, inf child mortality rates. So I think I'll stop at that point. Thank you. So before we turn to Carla, who will be our last speaker, and then we'll open it up to questions, we have one more video to show you, uh, which has been referred to in uh, Christy Micus's remarks. This one, our final video, looks at the integration of services for cervical cancer and HIV. As she mentioned, cervical cancer kills an estimated 275,000 women every year, 85% of whom are in developing countries. The link between HIV and cervical cancer in women is direct and deadly. HIV positive women infected with certain types of HPV are four to five times more susceptible to cervical cancer than HIV negative women. So to understand the opportunities and challenges of integrating these services, uh, we traveled to Zambia, which has been at the forefront of integrating these services. As Christy noted, the attention to this issue has been heightened with the December 2011 launch of the Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon Initiative in Zambia. Uh, and that Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon is designed to build off the HIV services supported by PEPFAR. The Zambian government is also very engaged in Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon, led by the First Lady, Dr. Christine Kasebasata, who is herself an obstetrician and gynecologist. Through the voices of these HIV positive women who are now accessing cervical cancer screening and the healthcare workers who are trained to screen and treatment, treat them, this video underscores the importance of integrating these services to save women's lives. I went for cervical cancer screening because we know that um, people living with HIV, their immune system is low, so they are likely to have any disease which comes. I was one of them who thought that I should go for this cervical cancer test, and I was found with precancer. What used to happen was most of the attention was um, drawn to HIV, so interventions were introduced. ARVs were introduced, women were able to access the ARVs, but would still find that despite them accessing the ARVs and all the services that come with the ART clinic, they were still dying from cervical cancer. So imagine you treat somebody and put them on treatment for life, and yet they succumb to cancer of the cervix because you didn't manage it. So that is why it is extremely important that we manage the two. The, the Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon program um, is a program that is trying to integrate HIV and uh, cervical cancer services and we have benefited from that program. We're now able to screen women, especially those who are HIV positive for cervical cancer. A lot of women have started coming in for the services this year. We think because there's been a lot of awareness that has been created, starting with our uh, women leaders in this country, including the First Lady. President Bush's visits uh, also created quite an, an amount of awareness because immediately after his visit, we saw that uh, the turnout in our clinics was very high. I remember about uh, President Bush's visit when I was passing going to town, I just saw a lot of cars were parked outside. So I said, what is happening here? They said that President Bush has come to open the clinic for cervical cancer. The first lady, Dr. Kaseba Sata, she talks about this, about encouraging women going for screening for cervical cancer. So I said, the time I'll go back to Kawe, I'll go to do the screening. When a woman walks into our screening services, this woman is also asked about her HIV status, if she knows it. If she doesn't know it and she's never been tested, we also offer counseling and testing for HIV to this woman. Then the nurses will will carry out a procedure called visual inspection with acetic acid, which is just vinegar. They'll, they'll soak the cervix for roughly about five minutes to be able to identify precancerous lesions. If the lesion that is found is quite small, they use cryotherapy using nitrous oxide gas and they freeze off the abnormal lesions. 
However, if the lesion is quite large, they will refer the client to Kawa General Hospital. When I was told that I have this spree cancer me, I thought that that was the end of me. But I was told that no, when we find you with this spree cancer, it's curable. I would say the major challenge that we have right now is the staffing. The entire province only has five people who are trained and yet, um, as you've heard, we have screened over a thousand women in the five months. So there are times when it could be quite overwhelming. I think that both this government as well as the United States government have agreed that the resources need to be found. We need to make sure that not only Lusaka, but that every woman can have this service done wherever they are. And that will require a lot of training, a lot of equipment, and a lot of resources. But I am very hopeful that through this, within the next four or five years, I think we should see cancer of the cervix going on the decline. By offering these services that I'm giving to these women, I feel that I'm improving their life because I, I get assured that this woman has a little longer to live other than her um, dying from cervical cancer. Yes, we are happy to have these services, ART services and cancer screening because it's helping the women in the community and from other communities. I went for treatment and now I'm feeling fine and I'm very sure that I've been cured. So now for our last speaker, we're going to turn to Carla Coppell, who is USAID's Senior Coordinator for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment and a senior advisor to the USAID Administrator. In this role, she spearheads the, the advancement of US development assistance efforts to serve and empower women around the world and to ensure that programs are designed and implemented in a gender-sensitive manner. Carla. Thanks so much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I want to first congratulate uh, CSIS, Steve, Janet, on the report on this event. I think it's tremendously important that we frame where we've gotten to and where we need to go. Um, when we were talking about what I should uh, say, um, basically Janet said, well, you know, what have you done for me lately? Uh, not literally, but she said, you know, we know all that's happened. We're all about business and progress, so maybe you can tell us about what's to come and what we're doing to move this forward. And that's a, I have to say, that's a very comfortable space for me to speak from uh, because I really am all about moving forward. And as Secretary Sebelius said, um, all of this only matters, the framework, the strategies, the, the vision and the rhetoric, if it makes a difference for people on the ground and the people we've heard about in the video. Um, so where are we focused? Uh, well, USAID is really focused on two things, um, implementation, of policies and strategies, some of which have been referred to over the course of today, and institutionalization of these commitments so that they endure for the long term. Uh, we have now a comprehensive strategy, set of strategies and policies. And as we move forward to implement those, one of the things that came about recently was a presidential executive order that institutionalized permanently both the position of ambassador for global women's issues at the State Department as well as my position within the office of the administrator at USAID. And we hope that by creating, by putting in place that presidential order, uh, or I guess it was a presidential memorandum, what we know to be the case now, that having that representation at the top, that viewing a commitment to gender equality and women's empowerment as transformative in delivering for U.S. foreign policy and for delivering on the ground will stick and will stay for the foreseeable future. If I then turn and think a bit about what we're doing to move our policies and strategies forward within USAID, um, I would point to very concrete things that we've done since that policy was released and 
and it's almost exactly, I think it's almost exactly one year ago um, that the gender equality and female empowerment policy was released. Uh, we've trained over 500 professional staff in different sectors and we're developing online training to fulfill the mandatory requirement that everyone receive training on how to reflect gender equality and female empowerment in our work around the world. Uh, the majority of our field offices, which are called missions, have in place what are uh, what we call mission orders, which are mandatory under our policy and call for really enumerating how they are going to roll this out operationally within their structure and the structure of their missions. We now have focal points or gender advisors in almost every operating unit around the, around the world and in Washington, D.C. to look at this issue, uh, to have uh, the training and development to be able to provide the technical assistance to other staff and to operationalize our policies and programs. We've put in place nine indicators agency-wide, five of which will be mandatory as applicable to measure the results of our programs, to see where things are working, uh, where there need to be improvements, and where there are challenges that still remain to be put in place. And to make sure that we're taking care of the, the men and women within the agency itself, we've created something called Women at Aid, which is a new affinity group on how we ensure that our work environment is one that is conducive to success. And in fact, next week we're organizing a, an event on men and work family and work life balance to ensure that we're really dealing with gender issues within USAID itself. Um, so that's the institution and how we're moving the policy forward. And I have to say that the uptake and the adoption and, and the willingness of people to embrace all that we're doing and move this agenda forward has been very, very rewarding. People don't say why. They say, give me the tools to do it and how can I move this agenda forward? And that's incredibly important. If I telescope in for a minute into the issue of gender-based violence, uh, you heard from Secretary Sebelius that we now have a national strategy on preventing and combating gender-based violence globally. What that's meant for us within USAID is the establishment of a, of a gender-based violence steering committee, which is actually composed of program officers rather than uh, the people who are in our gender-based violence working group, which also exists. Because what we want to make sure is that as we push integration of attention to gender-based violence in our work, it's something that is really owned by people who work across all sectors and not simply those that are focused on gender-based violence. We're also developing criteria for identifying where we should prioritize, in part based on prevalence, but in part where we can really make a difference moving forward. And we've created and are rolling out an incentive fund for providing support to add and integrate components related to preventing and combating gender-based violence as part of sector programs in a range of different areas so that we really are appreciating how we can do a multi achieve a multiplicity of goals through a variety of programs in different places. We've also started to more forcefully move forward a research agenda. So on the gender-based violence, in, in the gender-based violence field, for example, that involves uh, creating analysis to look at how men and boys can best be brought in to help us in preventing and combating gender-based violence. And I think uh, Kay Warren's comments about faith leaders and their role is incredibly important. Uh, we are examining the association between women's economic empowerment and experience of gender-based violence because we know that econo women's economic empowerment can have positive or negative consequences for gender-based violence and we want to make sure we're getting it right and that that economic empowerment is reducing gender-based violence. We're identifying successful intervention programs that are scalable and we're looking across the relief to development continuum where there's conflict and natural disaster to see how we can bridge those gaps and make sure that gender-based violence isn't an unintended consequence of the process of recovery. Those studies are complemented by efforts through, for example, PEPFAR funded, funded randomized control trials that are looking in Tanzania at prevention and services on gender-based violence and the uptake of services and other HIV-related behaviors. That's one area. But really, the range of efforts that we're talking about related to both the building of partnerships and the integration of attention to women's health concerns writ large and, and the range of women's health concerns into programs across the board stretches out broadly. And I know my time is up, but I want to give you a couple of other examples beyond GBV just so that you're aware that they exist. Uh, in, in work around family planning and HIV AIDS, we're working on, in Mozambique on funding a strengthening communities through integrated programming project, which is integrating health, HIV, water sanitation, and rural enterprise programming. Through an AFIA program, we're working in Kenya uh, 
the Kenyan, with the Kenyan Ministry of Health and partners to accelerate implementation of various integration models that link HIV interventions with other el elements of reproductive health. And then there are a whole variety of broad partnerships related to postpartum family planning uh, that are underway in a range of countries, including uh, in Bangladesh and several sub-Saharan sub African nations that I'd be happy to speak to. This past year, AID's family planning programs reached more than 84 million women and averted 21 million unintended uh, pregnancies. This helped to prevent 15,000 maternal deaths and save the lives of more than 230,000 infants. We're exceptionally proud of those accomplishments, and yet we recognize that there's a lot more that we can do through the integration, cross-fertilization, and promulgation of partnerships uh, shaped based on an increased knowledge, awareness, and ability of our staff experts and the, sta and the experts in our partner organizations to think about these issues holistically and move partnerships like we've heard about today forward. I look forward to the questions in the conversation. I hope that fits the bill in terms of what comes next and how we're moving forward. Um, we are eager, eager, eager to maximize the results for development in all that we do through our commitment to gender equality and women's empowerment. So thank you. Thank you, all the panelists. I think you'll agree that they did an extraordinary job, especially in a very short time frame, uh, to give us a taste of some of the extraordinary work that they're doing and the way that their work complements uh, each other. I mean, it's a, it's a great opportunity for us in a policy audience here to be able to hear about all the interesting and important efforts being done and to find ways that we can be finding the synergies that are important to be able to bring these issues uh, to the fore, to continue to prioritize women's health and gender equality in the different spaces where we operate so that we can together have a, a, a more uh, priority focus on all these issues and to encourage the Obama administration in its second term to maintain this as a priority area. Uh, we were lucky enough to uh, have a working group that helped advise the chapter that you got when you came in, a range of uh, people in the Washington area who are active in many different parts of this community. And I think it's a testament to the fact that this is an issue, this is an area where there's a lot of bipartisan consensus. There's a lot of different groups that are working on this and we need to continue to work together to bring these issues forward and provide the evidence from the ground of how, what, what's working and how we can better find synergies together. Um, before we open it up to questions, I want to use my prerogative to ask a couple just to start it off. And I think maybe since we just ended with the call to partnerships, maybe I could ask Christy Turlington Burns to talk a little bit about the partnership in Saving Mothers Giving Life and your role in that as the NGO partner and what we might see as uh, going forward. Um, well, the, as I think was sort of appeared up on the video, the partners that were the initial founding uh, members were ACOG, the American College of OB-GYN, um, Merck for Mothers, uh, the USG, uh, the government of Norway, and, and ourselves. And there's a, a new partner that's um, just come on board, which is CURE, um, an NGO that we hope to help us in terms of um, supplies and getting needed supplies into both of those countries, as well as um, as we get into phase two of this, of this initiative. Um, I think for us, or why we were brought in um, was that idea of being a public interface to sort of share some of the, the, the successes that we believe will come out of this. We've already seen a tremendous amount of success on the ground, and we were in Uganda in November, and some of the team was also in Zambia at that time and planning to return um, in a few weeks. And what we were able to see in such a short time was just incredibly inspiring. Um, on paper, this looked like this is, gonna, this is gonna happen, but when you actually get on the ground and you see the coordination and you see the amount of pride and leadership at the village level, Level. Um, every staff was so energized as they were reading through their documents of, of maternal deaths that took place just six months ago on a monthly basis versus, you know, this month and last, where sometimes in facilities it was just zero deaths. I mean, this was uh, just a tremendous thing to, to witness and to see the excitement generated by what was accomplished when, when those goals were, were put up and, and, and the challenge was, um, was, was presented. So, um, yes, very exciting. 
And then just one, one question to Christy Mikus, who gets the award for having traveled farthest to get here. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently about global health diplomacy. And obviously, uh, a lot of the, your work in Zambia is a reflection of how the work on global health can be brought to a new level. Uh, but I wonder if you could explain to us the importance of the uh, women and girls and gender equality piece of global health diplomacy from your vantage point in Zambia. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think with global health diplomacy, um, at least in the Zambia context, it's been sort of a natural progression from working on such a large program like PEPFAR and then using that space to branch out into other areas. Um, some, you had mentioned, um, Janet, the leadership of the First Lady of Zambia, Dr. Christine Kasebasata, and I think that there's no better example uh, of a leader for a country. I mean, she's the First Lady, so that alone. Um, but she's such a, an advocate and an OBGYN herself. I mean, the message that she conveys to women and girls is something that no matter how hard I try working in the embassy, I could not convey to um, to the average Zambian woman or child. So working, I think, with uh, leadership in Zambia is a huge global health diplomacy lesson for all of us. Um, not just the, um, the First Lady, but the Minister of Health, the Minister of Community Development, Mother Child Health, people like Professor Elwin Chomba, who you saw on the video, um, who's a neonatologist by trade. I mean, she's, actually, she's a brilliant, brilliant woman, um, and just the, the talent that we have um, around the table for these different areas. And I think also the, the benefit of public-private partnerships um, is just absolutely tremendous because there are rules of what all of our organizations can do, especially in the U.S. government, um, of what our funds can be used for and not. Partners don't have, independent partners don't have a lot of those rules and restrictions, so they can come in and complement a lot of what we're doing for women and girls in particular. Um, we heard a lot about the USAID strategies, and, uh, and we work as, as, a, as one mission at the, um, at the country level. And so partners can come in. And we can also use the more voices, the better. The more people who are coming to the table at the leadership level in country, private sector partners and NGOs and other organizations, I think all the better for, um, for the women and girls in Zambia and around the world. So just before I open it up to the rest of you, I'm going to look for Jen Cates, uh, who's going to just come and say a word. We have a mic coming toward you. Um, Jen was involved in the IOM study that was just released on PEPFAR and is going to say a couple of words about the gender components of that study. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Janet. And thanks to everyone on the panel. This was great. Um, as this Janet mentioned, I had the honor of being on the IOM evaluation of PEPFAR. It was released two weeks ago. And it was a congressionally mandated evaluation. And as part of that, Congress asked us to look at gender aspects of HIV and what PEPFAR was doing to address them, including men and boys. And we have a whole chapter on this. It's probably you know, a very extensive look. Um, and I'll just say a couple of take home messages that we felt as a committee that the program really had, um, had evolved in how it thought about gender and the, pro and the approach it took and scaled up more um, over time, but that there's still, uh, in general, the response was still ad hoc in many ways and, and needed, you could benefit from more focused um, scale up. And also a big thing, and this I don't think is unique to PEPFAR, that the uh, PEPFAR isn't yet measuring uh, or pu putting out objectives, clear objectives for how it's going to assess the impact and providing guidance to the field on how to prioritize and how to really make a difference. So that was our big recommendation. But there's a lot, a lot of the information that you shared. We tried to address what PEPFAR was doing around it. So thanks. Thanks very much. We're going to open it up to uh, Q&A now. Um, and I hope this will be an opportunity to uh, ask some of the questions about these opportunities and the challenges ahead uh, and ways we can really prioritize these issues going forward. So over here on the right, we'll start. We'll have mics coming to you. And please identify yourself in your organization uh, when you begin to speak. Thank you. Uh, my name is Suzanne Ehlers. I'm with Population Action International. And first, thanks to CSIS and to Janet especially. I was a member of the working group for this paper, and I'm really proud of, of what it says and what it charges us with moving forward in this second administration. I'm just coming from an, uh, a luncheon celebrating International Women's Day, where we were exploring the sort of paucity of the research base 
for the ways in which women's economic empowerment can really be multiplier investments for nations. And so I'm thinking of my own beloved issue, family planning and reproductive health, and how we know that a dollar invested in family planning can literally leverage six, seven, eight dollars in different countries in terms of the whole development arena. So in this time of sequestration, can we hear a little bit from some of the panelists about how much more key those kinds of cost effectiveness arguments are going to be moving forward to really make the case for investments in sort of the F-150 account, for global health more generally, and then of course for the issues that touch the lives of women and girls most closely? Why don't we take uh, three questions and then we'll turn to the panel. So I don't want to ignore over here. So over in the red shirt over here. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Hannah Claus, I'm a gynecologist. I just finished a PEPFAR grant. I'm delighted with all the things that you're doing. And I'd like to just point out that women who have been treated for cervical cancer at once are still at risk. I was troubled by the fact that this young woman said I'm cured. As long as she has human papillomavirus in her body, She's not cured. And also, what are you doing about the men? And also PEPFAR, a strategic objective too, I think it is be faithful, which I think would help in preventing transmission. Thank you. One more question, and then we'll open it up. Okay. Yeah, in the, in the vein of sequestration, um, are there any strategies or initiatives uh, that the government is putting forward to empower more faith-based um, organizations to take a more active or leading role? Okay. Uh, the first question on resources. Uh, Carla, do you want to take that one? Um, I think the, that research and that database are absolutely essential. I mean, the, there's an incredibly important um, rights-based case, um, philosophical and moral case to be made for investments in all of these areas. Um, but part of my job is, um, is selling this agenda to a variety of audiences using a variety of tools. And there's a, there's a solid constituency for the data that indicates um, why investments in women's economic empowerment, women's health, uh, combating gender-based violence um, is it makes economic sense makes sense from a development perspective uh, apart from the other compelling reasons why uh, why that's true and as we've uh, developed strategies and policies and really looked at the evidence to make sure that it was completely reliable um, that we could count on the data and the numbers we've recognized increasingly how little um, there is of that kind of research that that really that really holds up to scrutiny uh, and that we feel that we can stand behind. Um, so that quantification is incredibly important and it's incredibly important um, not just for the purpose of making the case but also for designing and implementing and evaluating interventions for, uh, for maximal effectiveness. Kay, would you like to take the question on the faith-based organizations? Well, there, there will just never be enough dollars. Um, the fact is there will just never be enough dollars. There will never be enough professionals. And so the faith community can step in in ways that um, the government never can. The government has to do what it can, governments, both um, uh, globally and then what, what the USG. But then the role of the faith community is to fill in those gaps and do what only the faith community can do. The faith community has about 2.3 billion people who claim to be a part of it. And so there are volunteers sitting in every congregation, in every temple, and every mosque around the world. And so when those volunteers are mobilized, they can take the place fill in the gaps where um, a grant could run out. Um, a grant might not be given again, and still the need exists in a community. But when the faith community is, is, um, is utilized, when it's mobilized, um, just like we've trained 7,000 healthcare volunteer healthcare workers in Rwanda who are delivering primary care to about 80,000, they make about 80,000 home visits a year. 
Each healthcare worker has seven clients. Well, that goes beyond what the government can do, and these are complete volunteers. So there is a place for lay social workers, there is a place for um, um, that uh, task shifting that cannot even just go to nurses, even in HIV care, but to those who are trained volunteers in churches. So this is definitely a moment, um, from my perspective, for the faith community to not be discouraged um, in any way, but to actually look for vital ways to participate in, in global health. And on the cervical cancer piece, Phil or Christy, do you want to take that? Um, <clears throat> I can make a, a, a comment. I, mean, I have not been involved with the, with the HPV work in developing countries, but um, uh, one, one <clears throat> thought is that about what's happened in the United States. Initially, the focus in the U.S. was <clears throat> giving the vaccine to HPV vaccine to uh, girls who were uh, felt to be at risk. <clears throat> that is protecting the individual. Um, net, recently, there's been a, a shift to the concept of protecting community. So more and more attention is being paid to the issue of, uh, of vaccinating adolescent uh, males as, as a way of reducing transmission. And I, again, I'm not sure of how, how things are going in, the, in the, uh, developing country programs. Okay. So speaking to the question of how we get men involved in uh, programs such as cervical cancer, I think we look for every opportunity, certainly, to involve men in, um, in the healthcare system. Um, men in, in Zambia and in many countries around the world do not go to facilities the way that women do. There are social and cultural reasons for that being the case, but we recognize that and we try very hard to, um, we're even looking at designing facilities so that they're man-friendly and that uh, they're not just about uh, antenatal care, but that they're about comprehensive services. We're looking at lots of different things. Um, but one of the key entry points um, for care is HIV counseling and testing. And so I think that we, and even in cervical cancer, we try to um, involve, uh, we try to encourage couples counseling and testing because it's a way to reach the men. Um, and they come in and once they know the results together, they are more likely to follow a course of treatment if treatment is necessary. It reduces gender-based violence um, incidents when they find out together and they learn together. There's a whole host of reasons why that makes sense. And so we're really trying to encourage men um, to come in at, at that level. We also have programs such as Men as Partners in many different countries in which PEPFAR is working. Um, and these are explicit programs that, tar that are men talking with other men um, and again, there's no better advocacy than having national leadership, having a first lady or a president, ministers of health coming out to say, this is what's acceptable and this is what we expect and we want men to access these services. Um, so there's no substitute for that. But around that, um, we do everything we can to, to bring them in the doors so that we can talk about um, health for the family. Okay, we'll take another round of questions. Uh, we'll start over here on the left. The mic is coming. Thank you very much. Um, it's working. Well, I have a loud enough voice anyway. I had we question. need you to speak into it for the, for the webcast. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. I have a question regarding uh, the role of universal health coverage and um, the ways that uh, any of your uh, panelists have considered how that might be used to help achieve health equity for uh, women and particularly how uh, these universal health uh, programs uh, might help to achieve uh, some of the uh, priorities that you have outlined in your panel today. Thank you very much. And over here. And again, please Thank identify you. yourselves. Evelyn Chiro, I'm CEO of Global Partners United, and we're public-private partnership focused on technology application. So a uh, two-part question. One, have you used, and congratulations on all these accomplishments, have you used technology, telehealth or mobile health, in the programs that you're designing so that there's greater reach and you know, efficiencies? And secondly, there's a similar initiative to address the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. We know the prevalence of gender-based violence in the disability community. We know there are 500 
million women with disabilities, 80% in developing countries, who are really challenged to access healthcare services such as the ones you've described. We know that USAID has a very strong policy on disability program and, and infusion into all the programs of USAID. So if you could address that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And one more. Thank you to the panelists. I'm Mary Beth Hastings. I'm with the Center for Health and Gender Equity. Um, it was a great presentation. I just wanted to ask, because I didn't really hear a lot about um, civil society and, and the role that women's groups play in particular in, in making sure that this implementation uh, of all of these wonderful policies that we've had over the last four years, that that implementation takes place with uh, respect for human rights um, and that we're not just rolling things out without truly knowing what the needs are on the ground and, and how um, the rollout is going in, in terms of feedback. Um, for example, in terms of maternal health, um, that it's not just skilled providers, but how those skilled providers treat women. Um, are they treating women with, with the respect and, and with human rights um, that they deserve? Um, so just wondering about that. Okay, panel. Does anyone want to take the first question on universal health coverage? A little bit, a little bit far afield of what you're uh, usually doing. Okay. I just want to have a volunteer. Probably state the obvious, which is that in in countries where universal health care is available, there are a lot less maternal deaths. <laughs> um, I was uh, in India last year with Julio Frank from the Harvard School of Public Health, and he was giving a series of talks about universal health care in India. Um, and just seeing the history of, of the progression of, of that in a number of countries and how those uh, maternal mortality rates have come down so significantly is, is something that's, in addition to a lot of other things, is worth taking a, a good hard look at. Thank you. Um, technology and disabilities, Carla? Sure. Um, I think that uh, we are, in some cases, using technology. I think we're in the learning, still learning to some extent. but. A uh, couple of examples. Um, one is we are using mobile technology through the MAMA program, a public-private partnership on uh, transmitting information uh, through mobile phones about uh, child and maternal health care. Um, and that's one application. The other that we're working on now is the use of GIS mapping. And there are two ways in which um, that's significant uh, or is being used. Um, one is uh, the use of the mapping technology to bring together all of the data that's out there to look at um, prevalence rates and to be able to break that down to a greater degree of refinement uh, so that we're so that we know where to program and where dollars whether dollars are matched to priorities um, the second is understanding better uh, where from from sort of gross numbers where prevalence varies by location as well and just talking with folks about HIV AIDS infection rates in Kenya and the use of mapping technology revealed that there were vast differences in terms of prevalence rates among males and females when you looked by locality. And so understanding uh, those differences and using that as a tool for, um, for figuring out how to put in place a gender appropriate program is going to be absolutely essential. And then I think the use of the mapping technologies just speaks to a whole group of people that have trouble digesting information in other ways. The, the picture really says, can, you know, communicates a thousand words. Um, on the, the disability policy, really the work on gender equality and, and female empowerment writ large is part of a broader program around um, inclusion and inclusive development and how you move an agenda forward that better integrates um, the voices and meets the needs of a wide range of population groups. So if you look at uh, the range of different framework documents, you'll start to see a greater infusion of attention to people with disabilities, to uh, LG members of LGBT communities, folks who are traditionally more affected by, for example, gender-based violence in certain ways than, um, than the general population. And what we're really trying to do is make sure that there's a focus on not leaving out those subgroups within those populations. Uh, and I work a lot with uh, Charlotte and Lapa McLean, who's our disabilities coordinator, on thinking through these issues and how, how they come together. And um, 
Last week, for example, was speaking at the OAS with the Secretary of State for Disabilities from Haiti, who's been doing a lot of work with USAID on how to address the needs of uh, the, grow the much larger community of people with disabilities post-earthquake. Um, if I might also speak just to the civil society question that came after, um, I think the the it hasn't come out that much in the in the conversation, but the role of women leaders in civil society is absolutely essential. Uh, as partners in implementation, as voices for people on the ground, as advocates and as change agents. And we've spoken much more about uh, women as beneficiaries, and that tends to be a natural inclination when we're talking about health sector programs. Um, but women are really driving and making change, and Secretary Sebelius mentioned this in her remarks when she talked about the women leaders within the health sector. Um, our feeling is that they're essential partners uh, in every stage of this process and that part of my job is really to um, elevate the voices of women leaders for change within their own societies so that they can drive and make sure that these, these changes exist and endure. Um, and that's, that's how we will really succeed. Um, small anecdote, uh, unrelated to health per se, but we asked our mission directors, which are the heads of our uh, country offices, to hold meetings with women peace builders, so leaders in, in uh, working for peace in societies around the world in conjunction with the first anniversary of our National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. And when we got back in the notes from those meetings uh, that they had held, it was, it, it so reinforced the need to have these conversations with women on the ground because they said, you know, we held this conversation uh, and here are the notes, but they then went on to say all the things they learned in those conversations from having, having discussions with people they weren't usually talking with. Um, and it becomes really self-reinforcing and it's the kind of thing I really look forward to seeing more and more of. Just a small comment, not nearly on the vast scale as that, but um, you asked about disabilities. In, uh, in our rural hospital in Kabuye, um, Rwanda, there is um, there's a, a physician in Minnesota who's disabled, and he is an internist, and he does rounds every day with the physician in Kabuye by Skype. So it's, it's been incredible on both sides because here is a man who has been an, um, a physician all his life and has become disabled, unable to practice. So from his bed, literally in his bed, in extreme pain, he does rounds every morning with a doctor that he is both mentoring and um, um, developing in Kabuye, walks with him from bed to bed, I mean, by Skype, um, doing rounds every morning. If I could just add a little bit to the question about how we're using technology. Um, in Zambia, we are pioneering electronic medical records through a program called Smart Care. And um, in the health programs, and many of you who are working in health, you'll know that we track lots of things like loss to follow up. And the amount of people who are accessing services and then they just sort of fall off. We don't think that they've passed away necessarily, but we don't know where they've moved to or whatnot. Um, so this is a very this has been a big investment by the U.S. government, and we see that the that the Zambian government is now um, interested in taking this up. So that's an area if you're interested in looking a bit more um, about smart care for electronic uh, medical records. Um, but also on the just briefly on the civil society point, um, this is something that at least in the Zambia context, we work really hard to include civil society in all of our discussions, whether it's regarding our annual country operational plan or um, our partnership framework with the government of Zambia. And we find that in Zambia, the civil society actually use, they've been using um, discussions with the U.S. government as a foot in the door to talking with very high level um, representatives of the government of Zambia. And we've been happy to help um, create the, 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 uh, the space for that so that there's more of a dialogue. Um, but we have some very active members of civil society. Our most active members of civil society are those with disabilities. And uh, they're present in Global Fund discussions, or in PEPFAR discussions, and uh, they're vocal and they're passionate and powerful. And so we are happy that they're using us to get greater entree to decision makers um, at the country level. Yeah, just a, a brief comment to follow up <coughs> on the technology and health issue. Um, in one of the open access journals in the last month or so, there was a, a review article, an interesting review article about evaluations of uh, technology health uh, uh, programs. And um, I was surprised to see that, that there was a paucity of data, of outcome data. Uh, there are lots of, lots of process outcome, process evaluations, but there was a paucity of, of actual outcome or impact data from those kind of programs. And the article closed with a strong plea to embed impact evaluations into, into uh, those kind of programs in the field. 
I'm watching the clock, so what I think we have to do now is close off questions and give all our panelists a chance to uh, say some closing remarks, um, addressing perhaps some of the issues you didn't get a chance to talk about, uh, and looking forward to uh, what are the next steps that you see in this space of, of the health for women and girls and gender equality. Christy, do you want to start off? Well, I just wanted to add um, one piece that I didn't say, but a very important piece that is um, the uh, importance of gathering evidence and data. And at the moment, uh, Columbia University is is doing um, some rigorous research to come up with some um, mid-year results that will be released in the next few weeks. So, um, so please look at our website or contact one of our colleagues, Selena Shokin, probably the best one to reach out to um, for that. Those updates, we'll be excited to, to share that information with the rest of you. Thank you. Um, I think just to highlight the, the value of evidence-based interventions, um, and I think looking at this, we have so much data now that we didn't have even three years ago in the HIV context and in so many other contexts as well. So just using the data to make better um, choices and better decisions when programming um, resources, results sort of in the same vein, results speak for themselves. People want to partner and they want to invest in programs that produce results. So how do you tell the stories and how do you, how do you get the results and how do you communicate those results I think are very important. And I think just, you know, the cost effectiveness issue is, is huge. And I think in the PEPFAR world we have been so blessed with so many resources and uh, I think now the onus is really on us to really make sure that we're building from those investments where possible. Um, it's in no way to take money away from HIV AIDS. That's still the, the credit, that's the very important, uh, that's, the, that's what PEPFAR is all about. But how do you leverage those investments and how can other funding streams be used to complement PEPFAR investments so that we can really do a lot more? Um, in this day of sequester, we, we can't afford to not look at how to make the most of every dollar. Uh, the government of Rwanda has put a huge emphasis on women, um, very intentional um, on women's equality and in the government. And so the churches in Rwanda to be able to play catch up in some ways with um, that emphasis on women and their value and to be able to speak about mothers and um, the critical role of mothers, it seems, it seems redundant and one of those duh things, but to actually focus on mothers and their role, it, it's a privilege and it's an honor to be able to speak to um, the value of mothers and how important it is to keep them alive so that um, children have um, a mom and a dad as they grow up. Um, just a, a couple of quick comments. So <clears throat> one is that um, I think the future programs or plans of uh, the U.S. government really uh, uh, need to have a, a, a strong focus on non-fatal but severe outcomes of, uh, of maternal uh, um, health problems. Um, the second, <clears throat> and it's a follow-up to a couple of the earlier comments, that um, the more support for improved data systems in countries, the, the better. Um, most countries still don't have vital registration systems. And uh, that, that leads to uh, ambiguity in, in, uh, in data analyses. And finally, uh, the need to continue to strongly support and integrate uh, family planning programs into, into everything that, that, that the U.S. does. Mine is a pretty simple one. Hold us accountable. And I know that part of this conversation and the report and the research is um, related to that. but. Um, hold us accountable for implementing it, make sure that we're driving these things forward, look for the staff, the resources, the programs, and most importantly, look for the results. Um, because that's how not only will we know we're doing what we said we did, we were going to do, um, but that also it's having the kinds of results we all think it will have, um, but don't have the data to prove yet. Um, and, and really through that partnership of mutual accountability, we can really make an extraordinary difference. Can't think of a better way to end this excellent panel. Um, looking forward to the second administration and the different ways that all of us and all of you in this room are going to be able to continue the important work that you're doing, continue the commitment that you have on these issues. And hopefully we will all be able to stay in touch and move this agenda forward in a productive way um, and hold the administration accountable for uh, the next steps. So thank you all so much for coming and uh, thank you to the panel.